Hi, Shazad. Hey, John. How's it going? I'm good, man. It's been a while, huh? It's been a while, man. It's been a long time. I like your new office setup. Did you actually get the office in your in your home yeah, city? Yeah, man. I got an office. I got a studio set up. Then I have this team room set up. And I have an empty room available so I can, you know, expand my team and get more people on board. Fantastic, man. So thank you so much for coming today. Would you like to just quickly introduce yourself and just let people know who you are? So I appreciate you having me on the call. So my name is Shahzad Khan. I'm a direct response copywriter. I've been writing copies since 2017 now. And I launched this personal brand back in 2020 called The Laptop Living. And through that, I've been teaching my fellow countrymen. I'm based out of Pakistan. So I teach my fellow countrymen about copywriting, direct marketing, and direct response and everything. So things have been great, alhamdulillah. Thanks, man. And you and I got to know each other kind of around in 2020, I think. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So uh, I guess someone referred. Well, I saw you, you know, launching some trainings with Islam. And then I reached out to you about me potentially, you know, helping with fiber and other things. And one thing led to another. And we started, you, you know, helped me with a lot of things with my personal brand and everything. So that is how it started. Yes, and I think there's a few really interesting things I was actually talking about with you with a friend of mine yesterday because you've you've work you're working in a market in your home country in Pakistan where it's not so easy to do online coaching and direct response marketing as it is in the United States. I mean, there are a lot of challenges from the point of view of even just being able to get money and take payments where you are. So do you want to talk a little bit about that part of like how you kind of worked around or got started in the beginning, even though it wasn't so easy to do this? Yeah. So uh, back in 2020, I was looking for resources to be able to you know, become a better copywriter. So I went online. The first thing that popped up was a wise course, you know, the basic $297 course. I bought it. It didn't help. And at that time I was, you know, growing as a freelancer. I had a lot of uh, back in 2020, I believe I completed about a thousand projects, copywriting projects alone in, within that year. So I had a lot of work to be taken care of and I wanted more copywriters to help me with that. But when I went to, since I was working on Fiverr, I went to uh, hire people from the other, other countries on Upwork and Fiverr and they were charging somewhat equally as me. So I figured why not teach people within my own country and train them, hire them and, you know, uh, share the skill with everyone. And at the same time, during those years, there was a, a lot of misinformation spreading about copywriting in Pakistan as well. So that is when I had to decide whether to you know, step up and take control, share what I know, and at the same time, get to train people and have them uh, work under my wing or things along those lines. So it took me about uh, the entire 2020 to you know, start sharing my message, start, you know, creating videos. It's a lot of, you know, you have to, the learning curve is huge initially. You have to learn how to shoot videos. You have to learn how to be good on camera. You have to, you know, learn how to write scripts, then the lighting, then camera works. And I have to learn editing as well. So the first 30 videos I shot on my YouTube channel, I did everything on by myself, editing as well. So once I had something figured out and I knew that, you know, I'm getting views, people are liking what I'm sharing. So I launched my training back in 2021. Yeah, I guess it was April. So I do it cohort style. And since it is Pakistan, we don't have a lot of payment options available. It is not as seamless as it is in uh, America or uh, let's say UK, for instance. So everything done in Pakistan is it, it is done manually. Payments are collected manually. There are a lot of steps one has to follow. Uh, then there comes, you know, issues with, you know, verifying and making sure, vetting the people who are coming into the system. So that took a lot of doing. And once we decided to launch a front-end product, and uh, John and I discussed on that, and I had all originally shelved it uh, because the agency I had, they told me it, it won't work and things like that. So, so we talked about it. And now was the time to, you know, use it and take it to the mass level and share it with people so more and more people would be able to benefit. And that's when things got really tricky for us. 
you know, we were running campaigns at, for instance, 10,000 rupees per day, which is a lot in Pakistan. Uh, most people, it comes out to be $40 or maybe $30 per day. Budget on, you know, info marketing in Pakistan is a huge budget. If I tell anyone I'm running $30 per day, they, they might be, you know, confused. Oh, you're doing this much in scale in Pakistan. So initially we started with that $30 per day. And that still didn't, you know, get us the right kind of people. It was horrible, you know. We would get them to fill out a form for a $7 workshop. So they're filling forms. We are, uh, have people set up. They are making phone calls. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a mess. So we then figured out a funnel. John and I, we worked together on that. We figured out a funnel. We created this lab sales page. And then I hired this media buyer. And the media buyers would tell me that often it still didn't convert initially. The media buyers told me it is because of the colors that I had on my on my landing page <laughs> and you know things along those lines. So it was strange. But eventually I fig uh, we figured out how to actually capture the payments and make sure everything now it is alhamdulillah it is working you know smoothly we are scaling we have a lot of you know created a lot lot of impact in the industry in pakistan especially and yeah that's about it it's amazing when i met you first you were like i think i remember you were like working 16 hours a day writing copy or something crazy like that wasn't it you basically exactly. were never sleeping. You just slept and worked for a few hours, slept I, two hours and, and then worked on as the yeah, talk around. And, I, and when I was sleeping, I was dreaming about coffee as well. So <laughs> I ended up counting those. <laughs> so back in 2021, I believe I worked, I worked on about 15 to 1800 projects alone. Me and there, I had one teammate. So there were two people on me. So, and there were times when I would, you know, wake up crying my you know, eyes out that I submitted these seven projects and I have to, you know, take care of something else at the same time. So it was a lot of uh, workload was there. But the good thing about that was that it got me started. It, you know, got me paid. And at the same time, it helped me gain a lot of experience. Because now when I interview people for my copywriting positions and they are apparently successful in copywriting, but when I ask them, how many projects have you worked on? It's five, it's 10, maybe 20. But then I compare what I have been able to achieve because of Fiverr and, you know, doing all the donkey work. <laughs> so it has been, it's been rewarding in many ways. Awesome. And I think another thing that as well, like your work ethic is out of this world. You You worked your ass off and you didn't just jump into teaching as a beginner, which so many people do, you really had a lot of experience by the time you started. But another thing you did that was different to other people, a lot of people have this kind of burn the boats mentality where they just go all in and they have no real plan. But you were the opposite. Before you did it, you were very thoughtful, considered. You would put savings in the bank and you knew you had plenty of time that if it didn't work right away, you had time, you didn't need the money straight away. So would you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, about my background, I studied mechanical engineering. And after that, I, you know, started this job in, in my own home, hometown in Multan. And during that job, I was able to start a business with my friends. It was a takeaway, you know, takeout uh, sort of a small business. We did great. It, it made us money. And then my partner squared. I had to move to another city for a job in my relevant engineering field. And it paid me about $30 a month, that job, engineering job. So six to eight months into that job, I was completely burned out. They would tell me to fly off to another city then another move to another city and it was back and forth. So I quit that job and I came back home. We have this family business in my home city. And that used to be my last resort. If nothing ever works in my life, that is what I'm doing. I always used to tell myself that. So I joined that business and thought, why not? Let's help my father and my uncles and, you know, let's help. Let's do something for the business. And at the same time, there is this competitive exam that happens in Pakistan. It places you in uh, positions of power in the, within the government, you know, administrative, in the police service and everything. 
So I thought, why not prepare for that program? Uh, my a lot of my friends are bureaucrats, and I wanted to do that as well. So I remember reading, you know, English. They have this English paper and that. So I was preparing for that English paper, and I remember I used to write back in the day, twenty fourteen. I worked on three dollars. I got a project worth of three dollars as a writer back in twenty fourteen, and I quit after that. So when I remembered the fact that I was used to write and I can still write because English is the only skill apparently that I have, I can write English. So I revived those accounts, my Upwork account. I started working on that. And at the same time, I didn't quit the family business that I was working. I kept that with me. I kept building my freelance business and about a year and a half later, when I knew that, yes, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. My income is stable. I do not need to rely on the family business anymore. So that is when I devoted my full attention to, you know, copywriting. And even now, I'm not fully only reliant on copywriting anymore. So I have two e-com brands running right now. Because now I have an office, I can, you know, have people support me with all that. So two of the e-com brands, then we have my own personal brand, then we have my copywriting stuff. So it is well diversified. Then we have real estate and everything as well. So that wow, is amazing. how I like to you know, approach things. I didn't even know all that stuff. Shit, that's amazing, man. One of the things you did when you launched your copywriting business as well were most biz op type of things that basically the, the targeting is wide open it's like we'll take anybody if you're alive and you have like ten dollars in your pocket you can come <laughs> but you didn't do that you were choosy you said i'm not going to take anybody they have to be educated people if, if i'm going to teach them why did you decide to do that and how did it work out for you so what happens is uh since copywriting is done in primarily for the english-speaking countries and the projects come along from there as well so i cannot you know be bad at writing and consider myself as a copywriter, for instance. So if I run biz op ads and tell everyone in, on the, you know, in Pakistan to join me as well and become copywriters, they will join me because I'll make a lot of noise. People will join me. But what will happen is, first of first things first, they'll probably hate me after that because they'll know they cannot do it and they'll uh, dislike me. First thing that, and the other thing would happen was the negative thing would happen or would be that the market would, you know, catch up on. Market would know that there is this bizarre guy who's pushing copywriters and they cannot even write English. And, you know, the overall industry would suffer. So that's why this is the first prerequisite that I place. And that is what makes it trickier for us as well. You know, everything is manual in Pakistan. And at the same time, we have to verify and make sure that people coming in can write in English as well. So these were the two reasons. Yes. I think there's a couple of things that you did. Like you you said, okay, I'm you have to be, you know, an engineer or you have to have a college education to actually to do my program. So you made it selective. You made a barrier to entry, which not everyone can can do. And then um for the people who are coming in, you you had they had to actually make sure you verified them before, right? You had to make sure that they actually could write and they weren't just saying, Yeah, I can already do this. So you it improved the quality of your leads and the quality of your customers. Exactly. That is how I did it. So initially, uh, it is, since it is a manual, it is a manual process. So what happens is we get enrollments. I go through each and every form. I read the way they've written, their grammar, the syntax, whether they'll be able to become better copywriters. And once we make sure of that, then we make them phone calls and say, yes, you can join us now. So that is how we will do it. And when you and me, we, we we did a bit of, just for background, myself and Shazad did a bit of coaching work together, I think in 2020, 21. At that time, you had just sort of launched your, your coaching program and it was starting to grow and your reputation was starting to grow. But one thing that was a real challenge for you was you still had all of these clients and so much work coming in from Upwork and Fiverr and your online platforms. And you were trying to, to juggle running your coaching business with also running your copywriting business. And it just wasn't possible. And you and me, it took us a while to get to a point where you said, okay, I need to 
hire and delegate copywriting work now, get a team to do it, fulfill that so I can focus on the on the coaching business. And practically it was relevant. Once you made the decision, it was easy to do that, but it took you a while to feel like you were ready for that decision. Can you talk about that, please? Yeah, so it's it's more not me being ready than the fact than me, you know, embracing the fact uh, that it is okay to let other people do the work for you. That it is okay, you don't have to do everything by yourself. People are there to support you. You can have them support you, and you can support them as a result of them supporting you. So this is this is was this was a thing that took me a lot of time to realize that it is okay. So once we talked about it, and I hired this teammate full time. He was helping me with copy, and at the same time, what I did was I cut back on a lot of my work. So I was working on fifty dollar projects. I was working on twenty dollar projects. Then I would I was working on a thousand dollar projects, three thousand dollar projects as well. So what we did was we pruned the lesser ones, the ones who were you know below fifty dollars. Then we moved. We want you know be working on orders of projects less than hundred dollars, and then I started kept on increasing the cap until I found myself working with only three clients, uh, big e-com brands, and they paid me well. And I only have two people working for those brands, and I also pitch in with the copy that is high leverage. For instance, the advertorial or the product page. So that those are the stuff that I'll write because I believe. I believe I need to be need to have my skin in the game as well as a copywriter. If I'm sharing, if I'm teaching copywriting, and I don't know how the recent market is evolving and what is happening, and how how my copy is converting, so that is the reason why I still write copy to this day. As well. Awesome, yeah. But you you focus now on on the higher leverage stuff, which is what's most important. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah, and also I think the kind of key thing is this is like sometimes for something new to grow, you have to let go of that something old, even if it's something good, you can, you know, it's, it's hard to let go of something good, right? Yeah, exactly. Especially once you, you know, put your blood and sweat into it, like I did for working on a thousand projects a year and everything. So it's, you know, it's sort of, you know, being in an abusive relationship when you cannot, you know, part ways. <laughs> There is benefit, obviously, but still, you are just so into it that you, you, you become a sadist for in a way, and it is hard for you to leave. So I'm lucky that it happened for me. And I think a key thing as well, which kind of helped you with the transition, was that the new business, the coaching business, actually gave you access to a pool of talent. So you could actually, it was easier for you to recruit people to start delegating work inside the copywriting business. Exactly. So by becoming a coach, I came across people whom I felt they were my you know, spitting image when it comes to writing. I have the student who writes as if I was writing back in, the way I was writing back in 2020 or 2021, for instance. So having these, finding, being able to find these gems so, you know, it really helped and it took a lot of burden off my shoulders. Mm -hmm. And one of the other challenges that you've had building your coaching business, at least earlier on, I don't know about now, was you started to get some clones coming into the market where people were just going to your funnel, copying and pasting all of your pages and just sticking their face where your photograph was and copying your whole offer. So tell me, talk a bit about that and how did that work out? Mm -hmm. So... When it comes to those people who, you know, rip, they, they were, what they did was they changed the name of my program. So my program is, for instance, six-figure copywriter. They added another mm -hmm. digit. So <laughs> there will be a time in Pakistan when there will be a 15-figure copywriter. <laughs> so on top of that, they completely ripped off the program, module one, module two, module three, everything, the structure, the offer, the, you know, uh, the guarantees, everything was the same. So initially, I was pretty bummed about it because the person who did it was, you know, he called me a friend and a mentor or someone, and he used to tell me, I, you know, I look up to you and everything, and but he ended up ripping off the entire thing. So I was initially bummed about it. John and I had talked about it a lot of times, you know, we, we discussed it, and you told me to let bygones be bygones and focus on what we have, 
and that is what I did. I focused on what we had, the brand and everything to the point that now we have completely, you know, bypassed them, outrun them, outperformed them every in every single aspect. So they are still waiting for us to throw bread crumbs. You know, if I do a partnership with Islam and Fifi for email workshops, they have to now run and find someone for email partnerships as well. So if I have another guy help my students become media buyers as well, he'll probably go running out finding some. So I've always kept them on a run. Yes. And they, they always have to, you know, overcompensate and keep running after what I do. And we've, you know, tackled that and it is now, you know, gone. But an interesting thing is happening now. So what people do is that they pay for my front end since it is $7 only. They pay for my front end, they download the entire program <laughs> and they upload it on their websites and WhatsApp groups. Free course by Shazasa. Enjoy. <laughs> so, okay. but what they don't, what they don't get is my, so my front end comes with two copy crit critiques as well. Mm -hmm. Imagine a front end for $7 that talks about copywriting, teaches you everything and helps you create two portfolio pieces and helps you you know, and gives you critique on them as well for seven dollars on. Yes. So that is being ripped off, and it is you know I don't bother about them anymore. Well, well, there's two things I'd like to say about that. The first is that the people who were copying your stuff, you you already know because they didn't have they didn't put in the work to build their own course. You know that they're too lazy to work hard, and you already worked your ass off. So you know I can outwork these guys. They won't do the work to keep up with me. If I just keep going, I'll leave them a long way behind. That is awesome. And the second thing is, if people even steal your front-end product and they give it away for free, what are they actually doing? Yeah, they think they're stealing from you, but they're advertising you. And because they're giving you a product and it's your face and your name all over it. It's not their face and their name. So those even their customers, eventually, some of them are going to come across to you, right? Exactly, no doubt. And since my front-end... It's a front end, and I pitch my main, you know, back end as well during yes. that front end. So it it benefits me in every. Fantastic. Now, one thing is like you mentioned about personal brand, and since I've known you, like you went from being somebody who was like making good money, but not very well known, to somebody who's become like a bit of a local celebrity in your home market, where people are inviting you to conferences. You're getting opportunities to speak in front of big audiences. Talk about that a little, please. So that changes a lot of things for you. You, you know, you could be Picasso and people, if they don't know you, they won't, you know, come after you. So what happens is uh, so when I was writing copy, I was making a lot of money when it, as if you compare it to Pakistan and anywhere else in the world as well. But when I added this personality touch to whatever I was doing and I started a brand around what I do, I started getting a lot of traction and, you know, it's all about serendipity at the end of the day. So if I put out a video or I speak at an event or I, you know, someone invites me on their podcast, a lot of people are seeing that podcast. And out of those, I've been able, I've been approached by the, one of the biggest brands in Pakistan to, you know, work for them and help them with their marketing. But obviously, I, it didn't work out because of the payment issues that they they thought they could hire me for chief for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> but eventually, it opens a lot of doors for you. So you see, Alex Hormozzi says this, uh, that his entire perspective about things changed when he uh, saw you know Kylie Jenner becoming a billionaire or you know Dwayne Johnson. Uh, launching his brand and selling it for you know millions of dollars so what happens is if you have people if you have an audience if you have eyeballs you can you know turn them into money any given day so that is the opportunity that i see and i've, I've started creating generic content as well to cater to that those kind of people because if i talk, keep talking about copywriting i'll I'll be limited within that circle for the rest of my life. Uh, Ali Abdal is a great example. He started 
as a doctor who, you know, a student, medical student at Cambridge. Then he kept leveling up to the point that he is probably the biggest productivity coach in the world, right? Yes. So there is no comparison between being a doctor and a productivity coach. But, you know, you just let things flow. You create, you start broadening your horizons. You get people in and there's that. Amazing. Yeah, that's that's huge, man. That's really insightful. Um, so you're now at the point where you can you really sort of come to a place where it's you can you can almost sell a lot of different things to people because people know you maybe initially for the copy course, but after you start to get into other people's audiences, they just know you as that guy who's been on a lot of podcasts. They know you because you're well known, and at that point, you can turn it into anything really. Exactly. So there is this guy in India. Uh, his name is Ankur Varik. So Mr. Varik, who uh, he does his you know, he has these multiple front-end offers and they sell for, I believe, $7 or maybe $6 a piece. And he has five to, he launches a new front-end every three, every quarter. So he did probably a million dollars last year or maybe $2 million last year selling those front-end offers. So there is huge potential, especially this is something uh, I see a shift happening. Uh, that the Asian countries, the countries that weren't, you know, big on info and everything and all things online, there is a shift happening. So, for instance, if someone is running ads in the U.S., it is so competitive, uh, they can even they can't even imagine being positive, you know, uh, ROI positive on the front end. But I know people in Pakistan who do twenty thousand dollars a month on front ends alone backend and everything that is the rest that is you know another case so there is this potential in this asian south asian market that it a lot of people from the us should also consider running ads and testing things out here as well, mm -hmm. well i think from people from outside from like western countries what they see when they look towards asian countries is the language barrier is one and then I, the, I think the other big one is payment systems. It's like in the in the US, it's relatively straightforward. You got Stripe and PayPal for a beginner. If you are moving up and have a more successful business, there's plenty of merchant processors who can give you the processing power you need. And everyone has a credit card or a debit card. Whereas in your market, I think not too many people are using credit cards and mostly it's direct only transfer 5%. from bank to bank. Yeah, only 5% people use credit cards. So we have... So we have two e-com brands as well. So we got a lot of interesting case studies from there and are doing business in Pakistan. So about 95% of the purchases are cash on delivery. So I dispatch a product to someone and they'll pay me, they pay, pay the courier guy on the spot. And then I right. receive the payment after. So there can be cash flow issues if you are doing it at scale. And only 5% of the people pay through cards. But it is it is tricky. At the same time, tricky things bring a lot of opportunities as well. That's really interesting. So the actual the courier who's delivering the product is collecting the money for you. And how does that money make its way back to you from that courier? So what happens is, uh, for instance, I shipped about eighteen products this month in January for for a brand of ours, and it comes out to be about uh, seven hundred dollars worth of orders. So the courier guy is collecting, you know, unit price from every person. For instance, if you delivered a single product, uh, it product it is twenty dollars. Let's mm -hmm. give or take. So they are collecting twenty dollars here. Then the other guy gets twenty dollars. Then there is a forty dollar order. They are collecting everything. They are depositing in it to their courier company. That courier company is then dispatching it to my bank account directly. Hey. So there are a lot of returns. Uh, there are issues with that, uh, but we are trying to figure things out as well. Yeah. And you mentioned you've got into real estate as well. Yeah, real estate has been uh, somewhat of a bummer for me because the Pakistani market crashed. It did crash badly over the past two years. And when I invested, uh, it was slightly, you know, on the downtrend at that time. I didn't know it might, mm -hmm. it would, you know, dive even deeper, but it did. But I see real estate as a 10 or 15 years investment. So yeah. that is my money parked in there. 
is there, I leave it and I'll keep doing what I do. So that is how I look at it. And considering the way all the governments around the world seem to be running the money printers very hard these days, it's yeah. probably better not to have too much of it in cash. Exactly. They just get to print it and they just get to buy whatever <laughs> they want. So they, I was listening to this guy and he was saying that money isn't real. Because they get to print it whenever they want. Uh, there was a time when uh, there were you know gold standards and everything. Uh, for mm -hmm. you know every stuff you print, you have to put gold in the bag and something along those lines. But that doesn't exist anymore. So it's just people printing money. Basically, yes. And um, you are you so you said you mean you're in your office and studio now. So have you now completely separated your work? Like because it used to be you were working from home when we got to know each other. So now is your attitude? I work when I'm in my office and home. No work is done at home. Is that correct? Exactly. It has changed a lot of things for me as well. I've been able to work out. I've been able to stay healthy because of this. Because before this, I used to work 24 hours almost, other than sleeping or sleep. So I would just wake up, pick up my laptop, and at times start working on my bed. And there would be times when I would move to the other chair. Then I would be sitting in the other room. So I would keep rotating in the house. And there came a time when there was no, you know, there were no boundaries. I would be sitting with my friends and I had to deliver this order. Oh, I have to run back to home and get, submit that project. There would be times when I would have, carry my laptop with, uh, with me wherever I used to go. And my friends told me that if you will ever do this again to us, you know, bring a laptop to, the, to a vacation, we won't take you with us and again. <laughs> So, you know, it helped. Now I work uh, during office hours only and I leave about at 8 p.m., 9 p.m., whatever, whenever I feel like it, I come to the office on my own terms and things are now smoother than they used good. to be. And you got good friends that they were actually willing to say that to you, that it, you know, that it's, hey, you can't bring, yeah, your, work to, you can't bring your work to coffee or you can't bring your work to a lunch meeting. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So that, my friends have been very supportive. My family has been supportive and they understand that the work I do. Also, there is this a lot, since I've started creating content, you get to, you know, uh, read a lot of different sorts of comments. There are hate comments and there are good comments and there are people who have kept an eye on you and there are people who want bad for you. Then there are people who want to hurt you as well. So, among everything, among everything, and uh, my family and my friends have been really supportive. And it is because of them that I've been able to achieve what I've achieved. Does, does it still bother you when you see negative comments on your content online? Yes, it, it kind of does, yes. Because you see, uh, for instance, I posted, uh, if I post, yeah, I posted a video, a reel recently, and I mentioned in that reel how I've spent about $23,000 on courses and you know being being a better copywriter and improving in mentorships and there was this guy who wrote manjan seller you know it's equivalent of the snake oil sales went down so they are calling me a snake oil salesman while i'm telling them how to what i've learned and what is my experience with so these people who have no absolutely zero understanding of how things work online and what i'm at who am I? What am I talking about? They'll just come and just, just you know, say random things and uh, say hurtful things. So it kind of bothers me, but I'm trying to get over it. Work in progress. <laughs> Work in progress. On the opposite mm -hmm. side, though, you've got at this point now, what, hundreds of students, thousands? What kind of numbers? So we've crossed 10K students now, 10, more than 10,000. Okay. And from those students, I mean, you've got a lot of success stories and people whose lives are much better now from, because of the help you gave them. Exactly. So it, so being in Pakistan, even $500 a month translates to 150,000 Pakistani rupees. So when I started as a mechanical engineer, I was paid $30 per month. So if you are a doctor in Pakistan, you've, you know, studied, you've given five years of your life and before that you, you know, the top of the top elite student you become a doctor and doctor at 30 years old makes what $300 a month. 
and by the end of the month they don't have anything left and they are asking for you know handouts and stuff and can i jump in with a comment there what one of the one of the outcomes of that situation is that a lot of the best doctors from Pakistan are working about ten kilometers down the road from me in our local hospital, and I know exactly because they know treated that. me last December, in December when I got sick. I mean, all the doctors from Pakistan they were speaking Urdu because this they can get a good salary here that they deserve for their education and their hard work. Exactly. So three of my friends, one has left for the U.S. Uh, doctor friends, so one has left for the U.S. And two of them are waiting for their visas for the UK. So they're leaving as well. So if I give you an example of a school teacher, so teaching at school is prestigious, I believe. They are nurturing the young minds and it is important. But in Pakistan, they get paid what? $50, $100 a month. And they know they are educated, they know English. But And when they turn to copywriting, even if they make $700, $1,000, it's 300,000 rupees. Uh, even a teacher cannot imagine making this amount of money, maybe unless around they are 40 to 80, 40 to maybe 60 years old at least. They are at principal mm -hmm. level or the headmistress level. So that is why copywriting has created a lot of impact. And my program has helped a lot of people. Because even if they make $1,000, my promise is six figures in Pakistani currency. So that makes up about $400, $500. If a mother can make, you know, six figures in Pakistan and she can, you know, use that money for her kids to buy some things, whatever she, she likes, that is empowerment. That is the kind of empowerment we need in Pakistan. Amazing. I remember when you and I were working together, one of the testimonials was from um, a housewife and her husband was working. He had a, he's an educated guy, had a good job. He was working hard, but still they had a limit on their salary. And she started working with you, became a copywriter, and she used the money she made to pay for private school for their children. And I just thought that was so powerful because they weren't spending the money on luxurious things. They were spending the money on giving a better future to their next generation. Exactly. And she, I remember she told me, I do not do this to make, you know, to buy cars or make money. I just do this so I could afford my child's, you know, A-levels or O-levels fee. That's about it. And she was making, I believe, 50,000 rupees at that time. And the fees was uh, 35,000 something rupees. So I'm sorry I'm sharing every stat in rupees because that is, comes out on the top of my head. I hope you won't need to you know, translate them into uh, dollars. So, so that's about it. So you know, people are getting empowered. That is what the whole gist of doing it was. Yeah, and the fact that I think this was a key part of your your um, your marketing and promotion for your business is that even to make what is a small amount of money in dollars in your local market can be something that's completely life changing for a family. Exactly, no doubt. And I use that angle initially. I was a lot, uh, you know, I was inclining toward Bizo, but Adil, I talked to Adil Marsi, and he told me that copywriting is not Bizo. Behave yourself, and you know. Uh, work on it in the in the right way and change the direction and I did and it still you know works great converts great so shout out to Adel as well. I think Adel has been a copywriter for so long like he's been in the industry since he was a teenager and he's now I don't want to say what age he is because he's you know he doesn't want people to know his age <laughs> but um he has sort of said like there was a time when he was young where nobody wanted copywriting training it wasn't you know it wasn't popular it was a weird little hobby for strange unusual people and nowadays it's become since i think dan Locke is the guy who really brought it mainstream yeah. and made it a everybody knows what copywriting is whereas before people didn't even know what it was and uh, it did be kind of become a biz up but you're right it's it's not biz up because it's not easy money you have to put in a lot of hard work to be able to make a living but it is worth it. Yeah, and especially in Pakistan as well. Because in Pakistan, we have additional barriers of you know, being able to write good English and everything. So mm -hmm. that is why in Pakistan, I cannot you know, have people tell them that this is a bizarre and you will make X and Y and Z. Yes. Um, and you know, the usual thing that everyone talks about today, I think it is important, is like the concerns that people have about how AI is affecting the industry. And I know that 
I mean, that's affected even like the very wealthy and successful copywriters who are making hundreds of thousands a year. But for, I think it affects the people maybe at the lower level, the beginner level more. So could you talk a little bit about how you've seen that impact with your students and what you've been doing to help them actually say, well, this is not a threat. This can actually be an opportunity and an advantage if we use it properly. So currently none of my students has ever told me that they've, you know, been fired because of AI or, you know, things along those lines. Even I worked on Fiverr and, you know, those clients are still there. I still get messages and I tell them I don't have time to, you know, work on their projects. But at, but at the same time, obviously, AI has had an impact. It has, you know, uh, especially with chat GPT. AI used to exist before chat GPT, but chat GPT made it mainstream and everyone knows uh, and, you know, everything. So I've been working with seven, eight figure businesses right now. And the way I have seen them use AI is for research only most likely. So they tell me to do my research by AI. So when it used to take me maybe five hours to do research, I now do it in three hours or two hours max. So that is the most important. And I, when it comes to e-com brands, there is certain type of copy that is that you don't need to be, you know, as a stickler about when you when you write it. For instance, if you're writing a, a brochure or if you're writing a packaging of a product, you can have AI write it. But at the same time, you need a certain type of talent and acumen and understanding of copywriting and marketing to be able to use AI for you know your benefit. And overall, for me, I have heard stories that people get people you know getting fired and everything. But I haven't been impacted by it directly, and I haven't seen a student of mine being impacted by it. To this awesome. day. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um. Yeah. I really appreciate you coming to do this with me today, Shadal. I really appreciate you coming for this conversation. Um. Where can people find you? What's the best way to people to find out a little bit more about you? So I have my Facebook profile. I make a lot of noise and a lot of posts and a lot of videos. <laughs> so they can easily find me on Facebook. My ID is Shazad Khan. And if they want to, uh, I'll probably share the link with John so he can you know, share it with you. So yeah, I'll put it in the video a, description. Yeah. Dropping me a message would be the best. I check my message regularly, even spam yes. folder as well at times. And it is true, you um because you've got a big audience now, everything you say generates a lot of controversy. You just say what you want and then you have to, you know, people split into two. Yeah, you're right, Shazad. No, Shazad, this is completely wrong. And then they all start to argue with each other in the comments. Yeah, so my, <laughs> yeah, it happened. It happens almost every time. And I recently created a video and it went viral, 2.7 million views. And, wow. you know, unprecedented for me. I've been creating content for three years now. And first time ever a video goes viral and everything. And I, boy, I'm getting a lot of it. And now that video is going viral, you know, spreading in India as well. So what were you talking was, about? I was, uh, the video, the title was Five Worst Degrees to Do in Pakistan. <laughs> That's going to piss um, off a lot of people, of course. Yeah. And, the, <laughs> and the fifth one was uh, doctors. So imagine oh. what other would, ones would be like and everyone came at me. So every angle in every direction. But still, I got, you know, that was the first touch point. Yeah. I just want to drop something in here. For those of you who don't know, in Indian and Pakistani culture, like doctors are kind of just below God, but not, not far, maybe half an inch below God. So to talk about doctors and sort of try to take knock down the prestige of doctors is very controversial, right? Yeah, so that <laughs> went great. Then I have had a lot of other videos go viral as well. TikTok is a great platform in case anyone is watching and they are looking to create content. Start with TikTok, doesn't matter what type of video you create or editing or nothing matters. Just have an interesting hook, hook say something interesting. And I've been creating three to five minute videos of TikTok right now. And I'm naming them vlogs. I'm the first TikTok vlogger apparently in Pakistan. And okay. they, I've been getting traction, so parting note. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, I just I want to like kind of, you know, commend you for one thing to that is that like, a, you've got like just incredible work ethic, actually two things. But B is like you've the last couple of years I've known you, you've you're always prepared to try something new. 
and you don't worry whether too much about whether it's going to fail or whether it's going to win. You just give it a go, which is awesome. Exactly. So this is something I've developed because of people like you. I have people like you around. You know, you tell me what to do, the right things, the wrong things, show me uh, the right direction. So I'm grateful for that as well. And I wanted to thank you for that as well. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming today. I'm going to share your contact details in the video description so people connect with you on Facebook. And I really encourage yeah. them to do so. Um, yeah, your, your story is, I love your story. It's a great story. And I know that it's just, this is just the first kind of chapter and you're going to go on to do really great things. Indeed. I hope so. Thank you so much, man. Means okay. a lot. I'm going to stop the recording now. Thanks for that.